Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We will talk about uh, we will talk about how to uh, run it in MS Labs, but also we will talk about how to run it in the real servers because now I have an access to real servers, right? Not only my laptop, but I can also uh, deploy a real servers that are running in a data center. So um, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Jaromir. I'm based in Czech Republic in Prague. And I worked for nine years and nine and something, nine and a half years for Microsoft as a PFE slash CE. It stands for uh, Premier Field Engineer slash Customer Engineer. We were rebranded. And now I join different company. <laughs> can I can I name the company or it's restricted because we paid only for one what, session? What, this is the first and the last time you name it, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, this is the first it. time. And okay, I now work for the Dell with my colleagues you heard yesterday. So they are my direct colleagues. Um, so I'm now a principal engineering technologist. And I'm not only the engineer, I have also family. A lot of people actually ask me that, hey, what are you doing? You have to, you cannot sleep, right? You are doing so many things that you don't sleep. <laughs> I'm like, no, I have a family, I have my personal life. So so this is my personal life. I have four kids. Uh, seven horses, two dogs, cats, and everything. So this is at the weekend house. So every weekend, I grab a family. We go for the weekend house. We grab the dogs, uh, go there, and kids are riding horses. I sometimes ride horses too, but not often. <laughs> okay, so this is my personal life. So yeah, let's talk now about MS Lab. And by the way, Karsten, if there will be any question, it would be really awesome if you can just jump in and, uh, you know, say that hey there was a question like uh, is it easy to run it or how do you run it because maybe sometimes I will I will just um, you know be too fast or maybe something is too obvious for me and um, sometimes you know it's not clear to the audience how to start with the MS labs so if there will be anything I didn't correctly describe just stop me and ask a question by uh, for yourself, Carsten, or just from the audience. I don't mind. It would be even better to, you know, have some feedback. Okay, so let's start with MS Lab. So MS Lab is a GitHub project. Uh, it's hosted on Microsoft GitHub. Um, uh, if you just search for it, uh, the first thing you will find is this page. Uh, and uh, what it does is just a bunch of scripts. If you scroll down on this web page, there will be just a button that you can download a zip file. And with this zip file, it's pretty easy. You have four or five scripts there. Uh, first script is one something, second is two something. So first of all, you will just run the first one. It will ask you for ISO file and it will create some basic infrastructure. I will not cover this, right? You can uh, read the documentation here or, you know, you can search for the videos. Uh, I already created some videos on uh, on YouTube or you can just ping me, right? If you go to labconfig, there's my email. You can just ping me. And if you have Teams Federation, you can just ping me, ping me on a Teams. Just feel free, right? I, I would love to help you. Because I think the Azure Stack HCI is awesome. Uh, and I think it's the future for uh, everyone here, right? So this is MS Lab, right? It's open source. You can contribute. If you don't like something, you can just, you know, create an issue. If there's a problem, just create an issue and uh, I will reply. I, I can see that there are nine open issues because I didn't close it because there are some like of known errors. Um, so I just kind of keep it there. Um, anyway, what you would like to do is to click on the folder. It's here actually uh, called scenarios. And if you click here, you'll find that there's so many scripts and so many folders. And the idea was uh, to provide you a consistent way to deploy some virtual machines that are domain joined. So you can then start with something I call scenario. So every scenario contains a config file that basically says what you want to have in your lab. Like I would like to have a one DC, which is always there, but maybe you would like to have, um, you know, one machine for the Windows Admin Center, then maybe one Windows 11, a Windows 10 machine for, I don't know, management, then uh, four machines for S2D with this and that configuration of the disks, uh, maybe connected to this and that VLAN uh, with this IP configuration. Uh, all is possible, right? But for the starters, it's better just to start with the basic one, which is for Node S2D based on Windows Server. You can provide during the deployment 2019 media, or you can just provide 2022, and you will have 2022 server. Anyway. Uh, we'll be talking about two uh, scenarios. 
First is Azure Stack ACI and MDT, and second is exploring new features in 21H2. I know the session is called exploring new features in 21H2, but to explore it, it would be also, I think, cool if you could deploy uh, if you could deploy the lab to the real service. So this is something we will talk about now. So um, the idea is to have um, consistent deployment because if you just do some kind of deployment with click next next, you may or may not do something different every time. That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is so much faster if you just you know drink coffee, watch it doing its things, and you can you know open up the Netflix or Facebook or whatever and do nothing, just you know watching the service doing its thing. Uh, the, the the second reason is also that um, if you run into an issue, it will be so much easier just to redeploy operating system and do everything from the scratch to validate if it's your issue or if it's an issue with the platform. Like yesterday, uh, I was using Windows 11 to deploy uh, uh, just a GCI cluster. Like you know, at a start from Windows 11 uh, with PowerShell commands to you know create a new cluster with the nodes and was like always failing. I was like, oh, maybe it's something wrong with the nodes, right? So let me let me rebuild the nodes. Hmm, it's still an issue. Okay, let me rebuild the MS lab plus the nodes. Hmm, still the issue. Hmm, what to do now? And uh, yeah, it took me some time, but it is in Windows 11. So yeah, I will show you Windows 11, how you can manage everything, but maybe not the great idea. Um, what it will do, I will show you how to simulate deployment also in the VMs, maybe, maybe not. I'll show you just the portions of the code that can do this. But definitely, if you have a hardware, it would be awesome if you could use it to deploy your hardware consistently. And also, it's probably the fastest way because in 11 minutes, you will have operating system and it's domain joined, it's consistent, so always the same, right? So how does it look like? Um, so. In a picture, you can see that there is a DC, MDT, and Windows 11. So this is the MS Lab VMs that you specify that you want to get deployed. So you have a DC, a Microsoft Deployment Toolkit based on the same operating system. Uh, it's probably Windows Server 2022. If you use this parent disk, I'm using Windows Server 2022. And then one a Windows 11 machine, which is optional. You don't have to have it, right? You can run the code from the DC too. But I wanted to demonstrate everything from Windows 11. Anyway, uh, it looks like this. So you have your uh, server, which is physical, where you are running the MS Lab. Uh, there is uh, one virtual switch, MS Lab switch, but the difference is that this switch is enabled to uh, use physical NICs. And these two physical NICs are connected to two switches. And from here, you can connect your physical service, right? I'll talk about virtual switch and how it's connected on the next slide, but the idea was that you can in the lab config specify what physical NICs you want to use together with MS lab and it will use it and in, it will create a virtual switch that is physically connected to uh, physical adapters that you can connect to the physical switches and have there your infrastructure that you want to deploy. So basically I'm expanding the MS lab with the machines uh, that are somewhere physically connected. And the good thing is about this um, networking uh, is that it's completely isolated. So there are two switches. One is, I call it external here, uh, which connects you to internet. Uh, it will be automatically created by MS Labs if you say that you want to have internet. If you say that you don't want to have an internet, it will not create it. Um, it will connect to the physical NIC or if it's a laptop, it will, and if it's Windows 10 machine, there is already a default switch, so it will use default switch. Uh, you can specify specific uh, switch that you already have deployed to use it for the internet. And this will be connected for the DC. So the DC will be connected using this NIC to the internet. And then the net will be uh, deployed here. This is something that was already there in the MS Labs. Um, and you will connect to the uh, MS Lab switch, which is uh, here, right? The difference now is that you can specify physical NICs. As you can see here, it's connected to external network. And as you can see in a PowerShell, uh, it's connected to two physical NICs. In this case, um, two 10G NICs that are connected uh, to a physical switch. 
and uh, from this physical switch you can connect your nodes. So this opens a brand new scenario, right? Imagine that uh, you go to customer and you would like to uh, demonstrate the solution to him. So what you can do, you can grab two servers. Oh yeah, I removed the branding. Sorry, Carsten. Um, uh, you can grab a laptop uh, connected to whatever switch you'll find. It can be any switch. You know, it can be normal, small robo switch. And you can then connect your AX nodes or any nodes or Lenovo data on whatever nodes um, to the switch and deploy it. You know, in, you can interact it with. So um, because I'm running MDT and I will show you how to deploy the MDT using the scenario, uh, you can deploy anything you want, right? And you can scale up and you can scale up a big way. You can scale up to multiple racks easily. But this is the smallest uh, footprint. You can have two nodes directly connected, so no extra switch. You can have, yeah, you probably not have this server in your backpack, but you get an idea. You can, for example, provision the demos if you are doing some trainings, um, whatever. So let's go for the demo now. Um, I'll be RDPing into the uh, physical server where I'm running the where I'm running uh, my machine. So I will show you the Hyper-V console where the machines are running. So I have here two labs uh, because today I will be demonstrating two things. One is I just take HCI with MDT uh, and one is exploring the new features in 21H2. So the first lab is, uh, look, is uh, you know, you can have multiple labs with MS labs. Uh, the way I do it, I have different folders where the labs are sitting and you can easily uh, do it the way that you have a disk where you have your MS labs. As you can see, it's just a folder with, uh, oh sorry, it's a folder with uh, three scripts, clean up, deploy, lab config. You can copy this folder multiple times, rename the folder where it's sitting and in the lab config you can spot specify that you don't want to use any prefix so it will fail back to the name of the folder so i can know that my lab new features in 21h2 is sitting in this folder while my uh, azure stack hci and mdt lab is sitting in this folder and you can distinguish between using this prefix right and as you can see the lab is pretty small or should be pretty small uh yeah it's it's this one is larger 100 gigs uh, because I have multiple parent disks. I have parent disk for Windows 11, Windows Server 2019, Azure Stack HCI 2021. Um, yeah. Okay, so you define the lab config. You'll say what machines you want to have. In this case, I also have physical NICs names. So if I'll go to, um, okay, if I'll do, go to uh, adapter options, you can see that I'll have uh, two physical NICs. These two physical NICs are now connected to MS Lab, and I can now expand my lab with the physical machines, right? These two physical machines are uh, uh, Dell servers, sorry for the naming, but some servers, and I can interact with these switches using Redfish protocol, um, and any vendor can do Redfish. It's uh, industry standard, so you can just invoke against uh, the ILO or iDRAC or any other uh, BMC device and say what you want to do. Um, in this case, uh, I'll be interacting with these devices to say that I want you to boot from Pixie. Anyway, so I have this infrastructure. I'm, I'm now connected to Windows 11 from where I was configuring everything. So if I'll go to MS Lab, to the scenarios, to Azure Stack HCI and MDT, there is a script called scenario.ps1. If you copy everything from the script, put it into the PowerShell ISE, I have it in here, you can then collapse the region by pressing Ctrl plus M, right? So the code will immediately will be so much nicer because it's no longer a code, it's more or less uh, uh, headlines of what you will do. So what I did already is that I copied this uh, script, just you know, right click copy, and what I did, I pasted it here just by right clicking into the PowerShell. I'm not about to pasting it here. What it, will, what it will do is that it will set up the lab. You don't have to do it like this. It's better to sometimes go region by region, 
or just copy portions of the code to learn how the things are done if you want to document it properly. I, I'm not automating it. This is not automation, right? This is documentation. This is like documentation if you download the files, where the files are downloaded from, right? Uh, what is it for the file? So you can put this into the notepad and say, this is how I install my MDT. So this is how I install my MDT. So uh, the MDT is located on a different server. It's on the MDT server. So I wanted to demonstrate how to deploy MDT to this different server than you are logged into. This is the best practice for the security. You you heard Dave Kavula yesterday, and most of the these breaches are happening because administrators are using RDP to connect to any server, right? This is just wrong. In this case, I have an MDT deployed. You can see it's running on a different server. There is also deployed a database that is also running on a different server. On this database, what I do have is I have a computers already. That's in this case are my AX nodes. I was provisioning it using the script. It was everything super easy. The way it works is that you will paste this configuration script. Let me just collapse the regions again to configure your MDT. And you can then go and deploy virtual machines if you want. So you will create some dummy virtual machines that are connected to the same switch. They are just empty and are, are able to boot from Pixie. You will collect the information from the uh, MDT server, from the WDS, who was trying to boot last five minutes. And because you know that the first machine booted, uh, the first machine booted, uh, you know, as first, you know, the first machine was, you know, let's say, let's call it now, it's just the KCI one with this MAC address and GUID. You can grab the GUID and make address from the logs. So you will create basically a hash table and then create a reservation for the machines and add the object into the MDT database. I already have it here, right? So this is something I done. I'm not hiding anything. I in this hash table you can see what I was actually adding. I was just too lazy to remove it. It doesn't make sense to remove it. You can copy this information. Adjust it to your servers, use different MAC addresses, different GUIDs. You get an idea. You can have 20 of these hosts, for example. Or you can just collect this machine that attempted to boot last five minutes and create your the hash, ta hash table out of there. I updated the task sequence with the drivers. So if you will be able to see it, um, there's a task sequence for Azure Stack HCI deploy. There is a one step, one more step. First thing is that um, I do. Uh, run a PowerShell script that will identify the OS disk index, right? So this will be either the smallest disk, or in this case, it will be uh, both card and uh, AX nodes. Uh, so you will get an idea how to run PowerShell script in MDT task sequence. Plus, also what I'm doing is I'm running a drivers. So there, there is actually an application that will install drivers and firmware into the real servers. So what I will do now, it's easy. I'll just reinstall these servers. And the th the way I do it is just running a script, right? So I'll restart uh, my nodes just by copying these scripts and just pasting it here because, you know, you can do it, right? What it actually does, uh, the IP addresses for the ILOs and, oh, oh sorry, IDRAGs. And I'm calling a web request against these. So the machine will reboot and also what uh, and also it will be configured to boot from the Pixie. So the next reboot will happen from the Pixie and uh, I just forcibly restarted the machines. Imagine like SCVMM. In SCVMM you could do the same, but SCVMM would go to uh, BMC and uh, just issue the reboot, right? It doesn't configure the machine to boot from Pixie. So you have to configure it first to boot from the Pixie, and then you know the only thing you do from the SCVMM is just to reboot it. What you will see is that the machine will request the information from the WDS. It will get an IP address. It will um, um, it will boot to Windows PE. It will automatically find in a database uh, its assignments, its role. So it will deploy just the KCI operating system. It will join domain, and it will also deploy the drivers. So this will just give you an idea how to prepare MDT for your environment. So you can adjust it. You can pull request my um, uh, my project to you know add more functionality. You know expand it with other vendors. Whatever you want, right? We just wanted to do this to demonstrate how it can be in your labs or in our labs. Um, 
to uh, deploy as many machines you want consistently. So you can then continue with deploying operating system or you can just leave it at this and provide Windows 11 to the customer. You know, install here, uh, install here Windows Admin Center and, uh, you know, let customer to play with the infrastructure, to, for example, with the, with the deployment. Or you can deploy it with the, for the customer and let customer play with VM fleet or anything like that. Or you can do testing of the hardware. So this would be the first uh, uh, lab. You would probably see uh, in the monitoring here that once it will get into the PE, you will see the status. From the last uh, time, it took 17 minutes, including the drivers. If there's any firmware, it will take up to 40 minutes, depending. So you can see it's now booting. Once it will be in the Windows PE, we will see uh, in which steps we are now. OK, let's go back to the slides. Uh, you can see it's booting, so it's probably working. In five minutes, 10 minutes, you will see that the OS is already there, maybe. OK, um, so this was demo. Let's go back to the slides and let's introduce the second lab, and it's um, and it's uh, exploring new features in 21H2. Uh, there's a different screenshots about the, uh, of the machines. Uh, you can also have, and this is also really good practice, uh, to name your lab with the version of the Windows that's running inside. So in this case, it's uh, 2384.169, means that this is Windows Server 2022 with cumulative update from, I don't know, September probably. So in this scenario, we'll test new features. We will uh, do uh, uh, we will do deployment into the VMs. It doesn't have to be as many VMs as you can see on the screenshot. It can be only two node clusters. In this case, it's four node clusters, and it can be only one cluster. So in case you are testing, for example, network ATC, you will just deploy two node network ATC plus DC, and in this case, you will consume around let's say five gigs of memory plus, you know, around 50 gigabytes of the storage. So almost any laptop can do this. So it's really great to demonstrate new features to anyone, especially this is really great for the partners or technical sales who would like to demonstrate the value or the real systems to the customers. So the first lab will be rolling cluster upgrade. Well, where we will roll from the 20H2 to 21H2. And uh, there's, uh, script is divided so let me just go back uh, to the to the uh, uh, to the demo and i will show you the, the script for the exploring new features as you can see the os is now in, being installed this is the, the the one with the mdt and the elapsed time you can see what the current step is and how what is the elapsed time anyway we will not talk about mdt anymore we will now talk about uh, exploring new features. So we will now talk about the rest of the labs, the rest of the VMs. Again, you don't have to deploy as many VMs. You can just start with two VMs. You can easily go to the lab config. Um, here, lab config looks like this, and you can just simply comment the lines or the clusters you don't want to have or reduce the number of the nodes just by simply modifying one number. Um, this this config is also a little bit unique. You can see that there are more allowed VLANs. Uh, this is because of network ATC, or if you want to test your configurations with the uh, VLANs that are required for the network ATC. In this case, 711 uh, till 719. Um, um, and um, yeah, um, here is uh, yeah, and everything else is the same. Actually, there's a telemetry uh, level specified full. Um, you we, you can um, send uh, some uh, telemetry to the Microsoft. It's just about, and you can see it in the code. It's just about how long does it take to deploy the VMs and what VMs you are deploying. So uh, uh, the Microsoft colleague knows how what and how many customers are using MS Labs. Anyway, I'll not save this one. Um, I will do um explore new features it's this script and as you can see there are regions called prereqs and regions called the lab so if i'll be talking about rolling cluster upgrade i already did run the prereqs so if i'll go into the um if i'll go into here 
into my DC, that's for new features lab, you can see that I have, I have already failover cluster with my failover clusters. So in case I would like to continue with row cluster, rolling cluster update, I'll just open the PowerShell. Right. And I will expand rolling cluster upgrade scenario. I'll just simply paste it. So let's see what it will do. So first of all, you will run uh, updates to make sure that you are on the latest uh, update. You'll validate if everything is OK, and then you'll start rolling cluster upgrade. It's really good if you'll just you know read through the comments. Like, for example, here, if you are not running uh, your cluster from Windows Server 2022, there's, uh, I would say, a small hack to just you know grab the uh, rolling, uh, rolling upgrade plugin uh, to your machine, so you'll be able to run the invoke cow scan against the cluster, right? Um, and then we will uh, validate the version after the rolling, rolling upgrade, and then I will validate the version of the cluster and also upgrade pool of the cluster. And uh, I think there are also VMs. Right. So this is all steps that you would normally need to do also in the real world cross cluster. But what you can do is that you can simply try it out in the virtual environment where you are not able to break anything. And if you break something, you don't mind, right? OK, this is different window. Um, you don't mind because you can rebuild easily. So I will do the thing that I will open up the PowerShell. I copy the script, the lab for the rolling cluster upgrade, and I will just simply paste it. The same way you can continue with all other labs like Azure Arc. So the thing what I will do is that I will just highlight what you will be doing in the lab itself. In this case, I'll be mm -hmm. rolling cluster upgrade. Yes. Uh, we have a question from Reinhardt. Why should I copy the script from the easy to the console? To run the script in easy is much easier. It we is don't easier. don't have an easy on Azure Stack HCI, right? It's easy, I know, but I'm doing it on purpose because if you run it here, you don't know what step you are in. So it will just run and you don't know anything, where it is, where the script is located, what it's doing. If you just simply paste it into the PowerShell window, you can see that uh, now it's restarting the machines to apply uh, apply uh, the set preview channel, right? So I'm now invoking command to configure preview channel, right? And I'm now restarting machines to apply. So you can grab a coffee, watch the script, what he's doing, and from here you can learn how to do things in real world. If you may want to make it more complicated, you can, you know, change the uh, names. You can de de deploy the lab with your customer domain, and you know, try to, you know, uh, copy your customer domain and try to simulate everything in the lab, like you would be doing it for the customer. But you can practice. See, so now I'm performing the update. So it configured uh, the. It configured uh, uh, the preview channel. You, I was validating if the preview channel was there. You can see it's release preview channel. Uh, here you can see the list of the updates that will be applied. It's quite big. I think it's a bug, isn't it? Uh, 48.8 gigs would be probably too much. And now it's doing its work. So you can grab a coffee, Watch the script doing it things, and this way you can learn. And then, then you can ask really good questions to anyone, to me, to Carsten, to PMs. And if the customer will have a question like, how do I do upgrade from 20 H2 to 21 H2? And you will be able to do and show him this script or just you know create a screenshot, create a presentation. That's it. Let's talk about the next uh, lab we have. Um, it's Azure Arc. It's more or less a deep dive on uh, how Azure Arc works because um, I'm on purpose breaking it. Actually, there's a bug in uh, Azure Stack HCI module that registers Azure Stack HCI to Azure. Um, because if you will deploy a cluster with um, a dynamic domain name, is it? Yeah, so you don't have IP address for the cluster, but you are basically using the each IP address of each node and you register it into the DNS. Um, the problem with the script is that it's invoking command against a cluster and inside the command is cluster again mentioned. So it, there is a double hop, so it will fail and it will, you will explore it with this scenario. So in this case, I already have um, cluster deployed 
the only thing I will do is to register it to Log Analytics Workspace and uh, the workspace you will create and register it also to Azure. So you will again go copy the script for the lab and paste it into the PowerShell. That's it. Super simple. And you will again learn how it works and how it you know doesn't work. Okay, this this is what I can close. Sorry, different window. Um, let me just maximize it. I will open it up here. This is my VM. You can see rolling cluster upgrade uh, upgrade is working. I'll open up a new PowerShell window to work with uh, uh, Azure Arc. This one is more complicated, so you may want to explore ex expand it. And then you know just run section by section. You, you know you can first register it just by copying like this. You can this way you can learn how to easily register your clusters because what you can do you can easily modify the variable, and then um, then uh, you know use it against your cluster. Uh, it's supposed to be universal, so it checks for the modules that are being used. Um, it's checked for um, any case the modules are missing, it will install it. Um, so in this case, I'll, it will show you how you can log in in customer's environment without providing credentials in the Windows Server, because if you are doing it from the Windows Server, there might be IE configured and it will pop up and it will ask for allowing all the scripts and everything. Sometimes it's just much more easier to use device authentication. So all of these small things are documented in the scripts and you can learn it this way, you know. So you can go and authenticate on the separate web page where you will log in into the Azure. Let me just open up my port. Uh, my device login page, so I will just you know paste this uh, script, login in into the window where I'm already enrolled uh, and I'm already uh, logged in um, into Azure. So I'll click on another window, OK, 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 and the script will just continue. It will give you, for example, an option to uh, choose where you want to deploy uh, uh, Azure Stack HCI 2 or when you want to register it. So it will also grab available available uh, locations, as you can see here. It will go out grid view. So as you can see, it's now asking me what um, uh, uh, what subscription I would like to add it to, and then it will grab a location where I would like to. And that's doing many things like uh, enable debug logging if something goes wrong. So you can then go into the log and see what was actually happening. I'll be re registering it, in, in, it into the East US. OK, and now I'm using, for example, piece of script that will not ask you again for the script for the credentials. The registration will fail, so we will explore what was wrong. And this is the lab. You will be exploring what was wrong and everything is described already in a GitHub. There is a readme file where you already have all of the screenshots, what's expected, and this way you can easily learn. So. It's almost 40, so we have probably only one more uh, uh, lab to uh, demonstrate. So is there any feature you would like to see and you would like to do a little bit deep dive? Uh, Karsten, what is your favorite? Theme provisioning or network ATC or you know, kernels of three boot or? Yeah, I mean, first we have uh, we have one question. Can we onboard VS 2022 HCE cluster? Yeah. EI equals O arc. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, first of all, uh, there is one scenario with Windows Server and Azure Arc, right? So Azure Arc can manage servers, Windows servers. That's a known fact, right? And you can have extensions. Uh, what you cannot do is that if you go to portal, uh, let me just open up the portal and put it on the screen. Yeah, right? And uh, to add more from the from the same. Uh, um, from the same user, uh, Azure Stack HCI iOS is hybrid by design and Arc enabled. Can we have the same Arc experience with Windows Server 2022 HCI cluster? Okay, so it's a very similar question. Um, so yeah. if I'll go to Azure Arc, uh, you have multiple uh, uh, infrastructure options here. One is Azure Stack HCI, and, and here you will see only Azure Stack HCI cluster, right? 
you will not see any Windows Server cluster here. On the other hand, if you register, for example, this one, this cluster, um, you will see that it what it actually does, it, it will deploy, um, but this one is the 20H2, it, it's not 21H2, but with 21H2, it will also deploy, um, as you can see here, um, uh, it will deploy um, um, agent, uh, uh, arc agent, uh, that that's, can do many other things. Uh, you have extensions and it will deploy by default none extension. They will be probably just this dependency agent. But if you, for example, want to have monitoring, it will deploy monitoring extensions. But these extensions can be deployed to any server. So you will probably not see your Azure Stick ACI cl cluster based on Windows Server here, but you will see your servers from Azure Stick ACI here. So what it means, you are not able to do cluster aware actions. So you are not able to do cluster aware updating because I'm not sure if in, you are not uh, not able probably to do it yet from here, uh, but they will be probably enabled in some future. That's something what would be expected. But these servers are not, I would say, cluster aware. So you are not able to do any cluster aware actions, but you can deploy extensions, you can enable monitoring, you can do anything else. And I'm demonstrating this with the one MS Lab scenario. So if you just search for MS Lab scenarios, uh, there will be one with um, uh, Arc, 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 something. Azure Arc for Service is one. Yeah, it will be probably the one. Azure Arc for Service. So in this case, what I'm demonstrating is that you have three normal servers: 2019, 2020, 22, whatever. And I'm expecting uh, I'm, a, I'm demonstrating how to onboard the, the cluster, um, how to register it to the cluster at scale. So you will see your servers here and then enable extensions. And in this case, the extension will first, the first extension will enable monitoring. So you will go to and register to log analytics workspace where you will send the data and you will be able to update your machines with Windows update, but not cluster aware. Um, so, and then uh, um, there will be key vault extension, so you will be able to uh, deploy certificates to your service and just demonstration how to deploy certificates to the service. Yeah, and I, uh, I want I want to add, we have Thomas Maurer later in a session about uh, Azure Arc and uh, maybe he, we can ask him uh, again about uh, um, an ARC enabled non Azure Stack HCI cluster. So that right. cluster we're updating and something like that. Yeah. Thomas Maurer is coming up, I think, at, let me see, um, uh, in the, at uh, uh, 3 p.m. So after this session is Helmut Otto, and after that session, we have Thomas Maurer, Azure ARC overview. Learn about Ooh. hybrid and multi cloud management with Azure. So maybe a good question there. Yeah. So I will only highlight the the, uh, the labs here. So for example, network ATC is supposed to fail. It will not complete because the way network ATC works, it just tries to set up everything. And the one mandatory thing is that uh, it will try to deploy DCB. And you are not able to deploy DCB in a virtual machine, so it will fail. And then what you will do is that you basically add network intent for the conversion uh, uh, for the for the converged in uh, setup, so you will you know use all the NICs for both VM traffic and both uh, storage traffic. So at least you have an idea how to do it. I will validate the status again against the cluster. So I'm not logging into the nodes. I'm doing everything against the cluster. And to be able to do this again, you have to steal PowerShell module because it's not present in Windows Server 2022. So I'm kind of stealing it to be able to have it on the my management machine. So if you can provide a feedback to product group, tell them that this is blocking from the scenario. That this is blocking you from the scenarios like having a management machine that is you know locked down, and uh, you need to use this machine to configure your Azure Stack HCI clusters, right? Because now this is kind of not official way to do it. So don't tell anyone, right? Hopefully Dan is not watching me. <laughs> <laughs> Another um, question yeah. from the audience, uh, mm -hmm. Jaromir. In the cluster rolling upgrade script, I 
presume it's uh, it's about uh, uh, your your uh, cluster rolling upgrade scenario. If yep. we were to use this on a four node lab cluster with 50 running VMs, does the cluster where update give enough time for all storage jobs to be completed before moving yes. on to upgrade next node? This is completely production and should be and should be working well, except it's not right, <laughs> as you can see. So um, now it's, it's it's probably working. It was just a, a, cluster, a failover cluster manager being weird. Um, and yes, it should go and suspend the node. You will probably see in here that every action is doing like uh, installing all the updates first, and then he will go uh, enable storage maintenance mode probably, uh, move all the VMs from the machine, update it, put it back and validate if everything is right before going to another machine, right? The script itself, I think, is specifying max failed node zero, I think, or is not, in Vox, CowScan and CowRun. Not sure about the max failed, uh, max failed nodes. Maybe what this is something we should add. Uh, this is something that I copied from the official documentation, right? So you can test it. And if something goes wrong, you can then, you know, try it again. And if it's still failing, that probably wrong documentation because it may need to specify max failed node zero or something like that. Because you do, if one uh, node will fail, you don't want to continue, right? But this is how it works. And you will be able to find the bugs. For example, there's a bug if you if it will not succeed, you'll not be able to run it uh, again because one node is already on 21H2. So that's a kind of bug. So what you can do is you can manually go and I didn't find a way to uh, run uh, a feature update remotely. So what you have to do is you have to interactively log on into the machine and invoke it or you can just go into the uh, sconfig and just put it, uh, go there and from there you can update it. But this is more convenient, especially if you have a fleet of the clusters to update. And it's much more informative than um, anything else. You have a lot of information here. You can, you know, at least watch and see what's the state. Okay, so for the network ATC, uh, the, fail, uh, the lab will fail. I can show you that we will add some net intent and it will take some time and ultimately it will fail. But what we will do is we will try to validate the status, see what the status actually is. I mean, in this case, it's just, you know, waiting for uh, a network ATC to kind of finish the configuration. You can copy this script in case you have something going after. You can just copy the script uh, that is just doing something and waiting for uh, machines to finish, right? Um, then you validate everything. You validate if there's a VM switch, if there are VNICs, uh, if the VNICs are mapped to the physical NICs. So all of these things are configured with network ATC, but there are also things that are not, right? So QoS policies, it's there. Uh, flow control setting is there, but there is not IP config. No, there are no cluster names. Live migration networks are not configured. Um, Life migration option is not configured. So all of these things you have to know about um, you can practice and you can then explain to the customer, OK, we can do this and that and that with network ATC, but we cannot do this and that and that. And then I remove the intent and basically what I do, I, I show what should be configured, let's say manually, right? So instead of using a network ATC, I'm showing how you would do configure the same way the PowerShell. So you can directly copy the thing, these, these scripts and use it for any, any other deployment. And this will save you a lot of time. So let, let's take a look on the, th on the theme provisioning. Um, this will be probably a short lap. So are there any other questions? Because we have. Yes, Jaromir, there's another one. Thank me. you, yes. Jaromir. Yeah, thank you, Jaromir. Your labs are awesome. I <laughs> think you, know, you <laughs> like to hear that, right? Yeah, are you yeah. still using the Xbox controller for deployment? Smiling. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, it was really good. It was in your conference, right? So, <laughs> but I was, uh, I wanted to show how easy it is to deploy a just a KCI cluster. So I went with Xbox controller and I basically hooked up the Xbox controller to my machine and used um, a Joy2Key software to be able to control. It's free software, I think. 
uh, to be able to control a mouse and I basically was controlling the PowerPoint presentation and use Xbox controller as a mouse for uh, copying and pasting script. So we deployed uh, your Azure Stack HCI or uh, S3D cluster in your lab, right? So just I to demonstrate that. how easy it is, right? Because I think it's funny because I think this is the best way to, to be honest, this is the best way you can deploy cluster, right? To do it with a script that is kind of consistent and it's self-documenting. So anyone after you will work for another company, he will come to the cluster and instead of you know reading through the documentation that looks like a comic book because of it's full of the screenshots, he will just go walk through the PowerShell script uh, and actually he will be able to see, okay, um, what he, the guy was doing, right? So in this case for the thing, theme provisioning, um, I will create a volume but just by doing new volume, whatever, just a basic one. Um, see, oh, yeah, sorry, I copied the wrong text, whatever. Uh, this is cluster name. I'm, I created normal volume. Uh, then I will create, yeah, I'm now creating the normal volume. I will see how much uh, uh, size I consumed with the normal volume. Then I will create same provision volume by just adding one more parameter. I'll see how much this consumed, right? And then what I will do is configure pool settings to default to the theme provision volumes, right? So you can see that um, uh, create fixed volume. Uh, it was one terabyte. Uh, I checked the pool, the size that was allocated increased. The volume itself, footprint on pool is uh, bigger. So, and then you can explore theme provision volume just by, again, copying and pasting. You don't have to, you know, uh, reinvent the wheel. You can just reuse whatever was already created, modify it. You can change your cluster name variable with your cluster, uh, change your friendly name of the volume and change the size. And then you can recycle the scripts and you can always use it like this. As you can see, let's compare it footprint on pool with uh, uh, thin volume instead of you know, consuming three terabytes, we are now consuming 37 gigabytes, 37.5 gigabytes. So you can do some planning, then you can just configure what's default in the pool um, and do it with the script again. You will explore the pool itself. Um, um, you can see the default setting was fixed. We changed it to thin. And then if you create a volume without specifying, without specifying the, the, the type, uh, it will be thin. And yesterday, uh, I noticed there is one more setting that you can uh, configure per cluster. I forget the setting name. But now with the script, you can go and, and explore the pool itself uh, and see what, what's there, right? So you can just get uh, minus storage pool, uh, minus sim session, uh, cluster name, whatever. And this is your pool. You probably want to choose the friendly name uh, s2d something that's uh, always like this and maybe list all the features of oh, properties sorry and you will see okay okay what's here you know you will be able to see what's the repair policy probably you should not <coughs> modify it you can see what the version it is it's windows server 2022 right on azure stack aci cluster interesting and here are the supported provisioning times types so you can do thin and fixed provisioning yeah, you can explore more and without having to buy expensive hardware from whatever vendor. Um, and yeah, you can even use any laptop, right, to do this because you can do two nodes cluster. You can even do four node cluster. You can uh, assign it to dynamic memory and it will be pretty, pretty small. And as you will see, to set up this cluster, I was not using much. The prereqs for the theme provision cluster will be just, you know, install the cluster and enable cluster S2D. That's it. So it's pretty simple. It will not consume any memory, but you are able to play with thin provision volumes. Any other questions, by the way? Karsten. In the moment, there there are none. So I ask you a question. Awesome. Uh, what is your pre what is your preferred uh, a uh, feature in uh, uh, in Azure Stack HCI 21H2. Okay, so I like then. So it would be definitely uh, network ATC because I, I like the way that Dan is thinking. He's an XPFP and he's a really cool guy who knows his stuff, right? 
Uh, they came with this idea. I think this is the future for configuring your Azure Stack HCI cluster. That's why I was asking the question if they want to expand this, because my wet dream would be to have one configuration file that you will just apply against the cluster and the cluster will just happen, right? Um, unfortunately, it's not possible. As you can see, even with network ATC, you still have to configure some portions of the networking, I would say manually. Uh, you know, you should be doing it with a script, but it's not nice. What I try to do is that I try to keep variables in here, but it's always different. For the, uh, Now I'm, for example, writing the deployment of the real machines and the, you always have to adjust your script. So uh, you have to learn PowerShell. That, there is no excuse for not running the PowerShell. There is no tool that will save you from not knowing the PowerShell. Because what you, what I'm, for example, doing here is and the net, 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 uh, best practices. I'm basically, you know, disabling unused disconnected adapters with just one command, right? Then I'm grabbing the fastest adapters available. And uh, I assume that the fastest link are the ones that you want to use for the converge networking, in this case, converge networking. But if you would like to do not converge networking, uh, separate NICs for the um, uh, for separate NICs for the uh, storage traffic, you probably will do a different logic. So you will not probably grab fa fastest link link speed and then then the fastest net adapters. You'll probably grab different logic. You'll probably go just with some uh, Kaviom, so Melanox, or you know some driver, some some NICs that you will specify here. But you at least have some like um, I would say. Um, template that you can use and modify and you can practice. And this is the most important uh, piece. I already spent a lot of time doing all of this work for you. Uh, so you will be able just to copy it and adjust it. And by using this, you can learn. Uh, there is no other project I, I found that as assuming that you are running everything from the management machine to, you know, to comply with the best practices. And also, you know, trying to take uh, in, um, uh, I know, take in, uh, think about the things like, uh, you know, disable CSV balancer. You know, sometimes you may want to disable it, probably not. Uh, maybe meltdown spectre mitigations. Do you want to enable it or not? Uh, should be everything in one script. I also add secure core, so you don't have to go to windows admin center to click it there you'll just you know run the script to, during the deployment and uh, you should be good to go right or you can just then write the validation script check the check the check the registry entry for example if it's still there uh, and reverse engineer what registry is being set by just reading the script that that's the whole idea and it's not like something i would like to show hey i'm the great yaromir oh, this is what i do no no no. this is what i like to share with the community because i hate when i see someone struggling with deploying s3 cluster because he tried to do everything with a gui with server manager because there was some guide like 100 years ago that was mentioning that you should create volumes with failover cluster manager because why not right because in the storage you can still go here and uh, you know create a virtual disk Okay, Jaromir, I have uh, um, one question for a quick answer from the audience. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a bit complaining about ARC, I assume. We cannot onboard Azure VM into ARC because they are already in Azure. <laughs> How we can manage all workloads from one single pane of glass? And you have one minute for the answer because then uh, Helmut is up. And the answer is that uh, the uh, Arc is just enabling uh, it as a resource in Azure. So if it's already as a resource in Azure, you don't need to enable it as an Arc, right? Because it's already a resource that's potentially with some agent. Uh, but this is more for uh, enabling uh, machines that are not in Azure and you want to project it to Azure to have a single pane of glass. So ultimately you have a single pane of glass. You have a list of the resources, some of our uh, Arc enabled and some of our native Azure. Okay, Jaromir. More ARC questions? I would say uh, we, Leave it uh, to Thomas, we, we do yes. that in the Thomas session. Yes. Um, so we have just a minute to Helmut. I see Helmut on the camera. Thank you, Jaromir, for the session. I know this was not enough time to I know. Uh, deep uh, even grasp the concept of MS Lab. We have done, I think, two or three sessions already together. You were speaker at uh, CDC. Yeah. 
Um, you will have this video, of course, for your website to link it. So go to the Git GitHub and uh, look into the scripts. Uh, it, you, you need a bit time to start with it, but then it's really uh, great what you are doing. So thanks so much.